The year was 1917, and the Romanov family was in terrible trouble. Do not do the Russian accent. I think they'll like it. It's so bad, just truly bad. Fine, but I will not forget this dishonor to my family. <coughs> <coughs> oh, it's hot anyway. The nation had already lost confidence in Tsar Nicholas II. World War I was a political disaster, and workers, peasants, and revolutionaries turned their rage on Nicholas and the other Romanovs, Russia's imperial family. The Bolsheviks, later the Communist Party, we all know them, rioted across Russia, demanding change. Even the military turned against Nicholas, and in a final act of desperation to avoid civil war and protect his family, Nicholas folded to the demands of the Duma, or the State Assembly, and agreed to step down as ruler. On March 15, 1917, Nicholas II abdicated the Russian throne, ending 304 years of the Romanov imperial dynasty. The family hoped to start a new life, maybe abroad, free from the chains of the monarchy. Even when moved to imprisonment in Siberia under the watch of Bolshevik radical Yakov Yurovsky, the Romanovs believed they would still be freed one day. But what they didn't know was that Yurovsky was only waiting for word from Vladimir Lenin to execute them. In July of 1918, word came. Why are we still so fascinated by the Romanovs, holding out hope that they somehow survived their imprisonment and execution? Perhaps it's the fairy tale of it all. Nicholas and Alexandra were handsome, elegant royals who wrote each other love letters and lived in the rarest kind of opulence. As the story goes, they were devoted to each other and to their beautiful children, Olga, Tatiana, Anastasia, Maria, and the young Tsar-to-be, Alexei. I had always had a passing interest in the Romanov family and their demise. I mean, I'd seen the movies. Heart, don't fail me now. And we did that video about their advisor Rasputin's phallus. Rasputin's penis was actually just an old sea cucumber. <clears throat> but it wasn't until I went to Russia and actually saw where the Romanov family, well, most of the family, is buried that it really hit me. Actually, no. When it really hit me was when I got horrible food poisoning in St. Petersburg from salad dressing and watched an entire, very poorly reviewed miniseries on the Romanov family while in a power barfing haze. So you have that to thank for this video. <clears throat> Historians often say that Nicholas II was a man in the wrong place at the wrong time. A soft-spoken, kind man who was more comfy in the countryside than in the war room. I mean, there's no question that he was a lousy ruler. He was out of touch with the common people. He was blind to starvation and suffering. He allowed his government to enact violence against the masses. But maybe we wish that he, and mostly all the children, didn't meet such a bad death. The story of the Romanovs is a tale of a quest for truth, closure, and the solution to a decades-long mystery, including this part. One step. The Romanovs were kept under house arrest in three locations. First, a palace outside St. Petersburg, then rural Tobolsk, and finally, on April 30th, 1918, the family was transferred to the Epatsiev house in Ekaterinburg. Their move to Ekaterinburg in the ultra-radical, anti-Tsarist Ural Mountains, way out there, like Siberia out there, was troubling. Quote, I would go anywhere at all, only not to the Urals, Nicholas reportedly said on the train to the Ipatsiev house. The mansion had its windows covered in newspaper and then painted over, and was known by the Bolsheviks under the grim moniker, the House of Special Purpose. The Romanovs would spend 78 days in the house. Yes, they were prisoners, but while captivity was frustrating and boring, it was not torture. The guards even became friendly with the family, granting them little luxuries like books, newspapers, and extra time outdoors. One guard even said, quote, all of my evil thoughts about the Tsar disappeared after I had stayed a certain time. 
I began to pity them as human beings. I kept saying to myself, let them escape. Do something to let them escape. But this peace would not last. After one of the daughters, Maria, was allegedly caught in a compromising position with a guard, likely no more than a, quote, kiss in a cuddle for the birthday cake he smuggled her. Listen, Maria, I get it. It doesn't seem like there was much to do. A new commandant was assigned to the Ipatsiev house, a man Nicholas described as the dark gentleman. This man was Yakov Yurovsky. A radical Bolshevik with a deep hatred for the Tsar, Yurovsky instated more rigid rules, stricter guards, and harsher living conditions for the Romanovs. But he treated Nicholas and Alexandra with professionalism, and it was reported that Nicholas even came to regard Yurovsky with some fondness. Yurovsky spent his time at the house waiting for word from Vladimir Lenin that he should execute the Tsar and the imperial family. At the house of special purpose, he knew the special purpose. In an especially chilling moment, a cleaning woman remembered Yurovsky sitting down next to Alexei, the young heir, a boy that was plagued by constant pain and illness as the result of his hemophilia. Yurovsky gently asked how Alexei was feeling, expressing concern. This is spooky in retrospect, as Yurovsky had just heard the go-ahead from Lenin for the execution. Yurovsky was to execute the entire Romanov family and a few other loyal followers who had come with them, including a physician, Alexandra's lady-in-waiting, the valet, and the head cook of the imperial household. But the pressure was on because the counter-revolutionary pro-monarchy white Russian army was only 20 miles away, so Yurovsky had to act fast. He had to find a location to dispose of the bodies so that the monarchists wouldn't find them, because if they did, they might hold up the remains of the royals as martyrs, as relics. He had to devise a way to efficiently and covertly kill 11 people. Yurovsky decided the best way to, quote, liquidate the Romanovs and their servants was in the basement of the Ipatsiev house. Rifles would not be used, they would be too loud. Instead, they would use pistols and revolvers. At 1.30 a.m. on July 17, 1918, Yurovsky woke the Romanov family. He told them that the whites, not these whites, these whites, were going to attack the city and the family needed to be moved to the basement so as not to be caught in the crossfire. How nice. The family calmly got dressed, Nicholas even saying with relief, well, we're gonna get out of this place. Yurovsky and his men escorted the family and the servants into the basement. Nicholas carried young Alexei, who was unable to walk. Anastasia brought her beloved dog, Jimmy. Apparently, they trusted Yurovsky. Once in the basement, they waited. Alexandra requested chairs. The family believed they were being kept safe. In another very creepy move. That's Yurovsky. Yurovsky, who was a former photographer, arranged the family and servants as if posing them for a portrait. Really, he was arranging them for an efficient execution. A truck rattled outside, and thinking it was their ride to another location, Nicholas asked Yurovsky, well, here we all are. What are you going to do now? Taking out a piece of paper, Yurovsky read Nicholas his sentence of death. Uncomprehending, Nicholas turned to his family and then back to Yurovsky and said, what? What? I don't understand. Read it again. Yurovsky finished the death sentence and shot Nicholas II at point blank range in the chest. What followed was a bloodbath, hardly the quick and efficient execution that Yurovsky had wanted. The executioners were all untrained marksmen and opened frantic fire in the tiny basement, quickly filling the room with smoke and sprays of blood. Aside from Alexandra, who was shot in the head, none were given a quick or painless death. Due to the chaos, most were horribly wounded before being finally shot in the head or bayoneted. But something even stranger happened. To the horror of the executioners, the bullets fired at the Romanov sisters bounced off of them. You see, from the beginning of their imprisonment, Alexandra and the sisters had been secretly sewing the Romanov jewels, diamonds and rubies, into their undergarments as an insurance policy should they be exiled abroad and need to start their lives over again. Their jewel-encrusted undergarments served as a sort of pseudo-bulletproof vest. The Grand Duchesses were shot, stabbed at, but the only thing that would end their suffering was a bullet to the head. 
When the literal smoke cleared and the Imperial family and their servants were dead, the basement was covered in blood, pools of blood, and bodily fluids covered the floors, painted the walls. The whole procedure, Yurovsky said, took 20 minutes. The bodies were moved to the truck that was waiting outside the basement door. As this was happening, Anastasia sat up and screamed, covering her face. She was only silenced by a final shot to the head. Or was she? More on that later. The bodies were driven down to the forest, to the Four Brothers mine area that Yurovsky had scouted as the location for their burial. The mangled bodies were stripped, their possessions taken, their clothes burned, and dumped down a mine shaft. Only the mine shaft that Yurovsky had scouted was too shallow, only nine feet deep, with the water at the bottom barely covering the 11 bodies. Yurovsky doused the bodies in acid and threw grenades into the shaft in an attempt to better destroy the evidence. This was to be the last of the Romanovs, but it was only one week after the murder of the Romanov family that the white Russian army took Ekaterinburg from the Bolsheviks. The judicial investigator appointed to investigate the murder was pointed to the mine shaft by witnesses, and there they found bone fragments, jewels, clothing scraps, and other evidence that bodies had been dumped there. Evidence, but no bodies, only fragments of bodies. According to witness accounts and Yurovsky's own writings, he got nervous. There were too many witnesses to the mine shaft burial site, and his own men couldn't keep their mouths shut. He would have to rebury the bodies. As dawn broke on the morning of July the 19th, Yurovsky and his men picked up and drove the exhumed corpses of the Romanovs further down the road. But they got stuck in the mud, had to frantically douse the bodies with more acid, unsuccessfully try to cremate a couple, and then dump them in shallow mass graves in an area called Pig's Meadow. Nine bodies were buried in one grave, two in another, so as to further obscure their identification. And there, the bodies stayed. It wasn't until 1979 when Ekaterinburg native, the geologist Alexandra Avronin, and the filmmaker Gili Ryabov took another look at the location of the Romanov remains. Going off the accounts, the team located the site where they believed the bodies of the Tsar and his family had been buried in Pig's Meadow. They discovered a burial site covered with dirt and wooden planks. Upon excavating further, they found a jumble of skeletons that apparently had been doused with acid in an attempt to speed up the decay. However, due to the political climate in the Soviet Union at the time, the bodies could not be moved or revealed. So Avdonin and Ryabov secretly took three skulls with them that day and reburied the rest of the remains. Avdonin kept one skull, which he thought was the Tsar's, under his bed in Ekaterinburg for a year. That's really an iconic corpse staple move, isn't it? The stolen body parts under some random guy's bed. Tale as old as time. Ryabov took the other two skulls to his home in Moscow, hoping to use his connections with the forensic service at the Ministry of Health to get the skulls secretly tested. That didn't work out, and the men were too anxious, so they went back and reburied the skulls in Pig's Meadow, where they stayed buried until 1991, more than 10 years later. In 1991, Boris Yeltsin was elected president, and the political climate was right to return to the Pig's Meadow burial site. This time, Avdonin would be able to completely exhume the bones and place them in the morgue at Ekaterinburg. Thus began the quest to scientifically identify the Romanov remains. This next part of the script was originally 12 pages long. Who loves molecular genetic testing and incredibly complicated international political conflicts? Anyway, we included as much as we can here. The first character you need to know here is forensic anthropologist Sergei Abramov, who was sent by the Ministry of Health to identify the bones. In three months, he pieced together over 950 bones and bone fragments, labeling each set body number one, body number two, and so on. At this time, DNA testing was way too expensive and frankly unavailable. So Abramoff and his team developed a system of computer modeling, mathematical techniques, and superimposing photos over the bones to identify the remains. At some point, the American government hears about this and says, Hello, we will send the FBI over there to help. But two days before they're supposed to show up, Russia goes, Oh, never mind. No thanks. We found some guy in Florida to help. And they had a Dr. William Maples, a forensic anthropologist at the University of Florida. They chose Maples 
over the US government to help with identifications. And though he had some disagreements with Abramoff, bodies were identified. But wait, another player in the Romanov Romains Thunderdome was on the horizon. The Russians were not capable of DNA testing yet, but the British were. The Russian Ministry of Health agreed to have the Romanov bones tested at the British Home Office in England. This move raised a lot of controversy. First, there was a degree of embarrassment that the Russian scientists couldn't test the remains of the Tsar in Russia. Said the director of the morgue, Eddie Katerinaborg, we were working on molecular genetic testing at one time, then Mr. Stalin shot the entire team. As a result, we began lagging behind. Stalin did do things like that. It's one of the problems with Stalin. Second, Russia had long blamed Britain for the deaths of the Romanovs. You see, King George V was a first cousin to both Nicholas and his wife Alexandra, who were third cousins once removed to each other. Royalty, LOL. In 1917, after the abdication, King George was all ready to bring his cousins to safety in England. But upon realizing how unpopular Nicholas was in Britain, he changed his mind and specifically told them not to come, forcing them to be sent to Siberia, and we know what happened there. To many Russians, the British killed the imperial family. But there was a mystery to solve, so differences were put aside. Plus, the Queen was supposed to visit Russia soon, so the Brits were all about keeping things cool with the Russians. And in 1992, femur samples from the bones were transported to England to begin the painstaking and difficult process of extracting DNA. But here's the thing, DNA is helpful if you have other DNA to compare it to. Where were the scientists going to find DNA that would match the long dead Russian imperial family? Royalty, lol. Prince Philip, husband to Queen Elizabeth II, is the grand nephew of Empress Alexandra. His grandmother was Alexandra's sister. Philip agreed to donate blood through which scientists could extract some mitochondrial DNA, a kind of DNA that's carried exclusively through generations of women to their offspring. If the DNA was in Philip, it would be in any relative of his, alive or dead, who shared a maternal line. This could be used to confirm the identity of bones allegedly belonging to Alexandra and her children. And the mitochondrial DNA matched. These were the remains of Alexandra and three of her children. Only three of her children? But what about Anastasia? Let this wrong be mine. We'll get there in a second. Relax. Although it stood to reason that Tsar Nicholas was also in that grave, body number four to be precise, identifying him through science proved harder. The best way to compare DNA would be to exhume the body of Nicholas's brother, Grand Duke George. But the Russians said, Niet because it would be too expensive to break open George's Italian marble tomb. Okay, strike one. Next, they went to Japan, where there was a bloody handkerchief that had once bound a wound Tsar Nicholas received when a Japanese person attacked him with a sword. Obviously. The Emperor of Japan helped arrange this, but unfortunately, the handkerchief was too contaminated and dirty to get a proper DNA sample from. Strike two. In Toronto, Canada, of all places, lived the 75-year-old son of Nicholas's sister, Olga, who would be a perfect mitochondrial DNA match to Nicholas. Unfortunately, Kulikovsky, this nephew, declined to help, believing that the investigation was not only a hoax, but that the scientists were working for the KGB and only asking for his DNA to prove that he was not part of the Romanov family. Strike three. Going back to the family tree, the scientists looked at the women in Nicholas's family and found that Nicholas's sister had a daughter, Irina. Princess Irina married Prince Felix Yusupov, the man who killed Rasputin, and had a daughter. And that daughter had a daughter, and that daughter was like, sure, I'll give you my DNA. Finally, along with another donor, a 66-year-old Scottish nobleman, a distant cousin of Nicholas's, Team DNA had two DNA sources with which to compare. And success, they were a match. Well, except for a mutation. Basically, Nicholas II possessed a mutation where he had two forms of mitochondrial DNA, an inherited condition known as heteroplasmy. But the team still announced their findings in 1993, stating they were 98.5% certain these were the Romanovs. This announcement sparked more controversy. 
This is the part we cut most of, but it involves the forensic anthropologist guy from Florida, the TV show Unsolved Mysteries, University of California, Berkeley, Cambridge University, heteroplasmy drama, and sample contamination. It's too much for this video, but if your thing is genetic mutation and DNA testing, we'll link those resources below. Needless to say, the British team was correct. Confirmed again when they finally got permission to exhume that body in the marble tomb, George Romanoff, Nicholas's brother. The DNA was a match, and both brothers had heteroplasmy to boot. To most, the identities of the Ekaterinburg remains had been confirmed, and the Romanovs had been found. To most. Remember, there was still that separate grave, meaning there were still two missing bodies of two Romanov children, believed to be Alexei and Maria, though some insisted it was not Maria, but Anastasia that was missing. Despite their doubts, in 1998, the Russian Orthodox Church, urged by President Boris Yeltsin, allowed the alleged remains of Nicholas, Alexandra, Olga, Tatiana, and Anastasia, slash maybe Maria, to be buried in the Cathedral of Saints Peter and Paul in St. Petersburg, the traditional resting place of the Romanov dynasty, which is where I saw them this summer. However, due to their doubts, the church did not give the family the full rights. The funeral was conducted by deacons, not bishops, and members of the Russian Orthodox Church and the surviving Romanov families were conspicuously absent. In 2000, the Russian Orthodox Church canonized Nicholas, Alexandra, and their children, further tightening their grip on their control of the Romanov legacy. But in 2007, a discovery. Two more bodies were found in Pig's Meadow by a group called SEARCH, or the Scientific Expedition to Account for the Romanov Children. Discovered in a pit 230 feet away from where Nicholas had been buried, the unearthed skeletons appeared to have suffered major trauma and had been burned by acid or fire. Testing revealed that the skeleton of the young girl, aged 18 to 23, was four trillion times more likely to be a daughter of Nicholas and Alexandra's than not. The skeleton of the boy, aged 10 to 13, was 80 trillion times more likely to be their son than not. But to this day, that is still not good enough for the Russian Orthodox Church. The bones of Alexei and likely Maria are stored in the medical refrigerator at the Forensic Research Bureau in Ekaterinburg, unburied. Despite requests from Romanov descendants and overwhelming DNA evidence, the church claims that it needs more evidence and will not allow them to be buried at the cathedral in St. Petersburg. Pushing the issue upsets the Russian Orthodox Church and, well, Vladimir Putin, who allegedly both believe that the Romanov remains were destroyed after they were killed in a ritual murder by the real culprits. Jewish people. That's not what happened, but please don't Kremlin bot me. Don't have the time right now. So, there in that refrigerator, the last remains of the Romanovs wait for their burial. But wait, what about Anastasia? We can't get away with doing a Romanov video without talking about the Anastasia myth. After the execution, the death of Tsar Nicholas and only Nicholas was announced in Russia. Lenin led people to believe that Alexandra and the children had been spared and were being kept somewhere safe. That lie and the hope that one of the Tsar's beautiful daughters had survived fed into this myth that Anastasia was still alive. There were countless Anastasia imposters, but the most convincing was a woman who came to call herself Anna Anderson. First appearing in Berlin in 1920 after she jumped from a bridge, she was initially called Fraulein Unbekannt, or Miss Unknown. In and out of hospitals and asylums, she admitted to being Grand Duchess Anastasia and concocted an elaborate story about walking across Europe to find her aunt. Eventually, the Romanovs' former tutor, Pierre Guillard, and the children's favorite aunt, the Grand Duchess Olga, went to see this Anastasia while she was very sick at St. Mary's Hospital. While the kind-hearted Olga visited Miss Unknown for months, she had her doubts, though her doubts were not absolute. And this is what Anna Anderson, aka Anastasia, played on. Most of the Romanov family doubted her, but there were also doubts to their doubts. The way she spoke, what she knew, the way she carried herself, her feet. Yes, Anna Anderson appeared to have the distinctive feet of Anastasia. Made more than a couple members of the Romanov family not only vouch for her, but embrace her, welcoming her into their luxurious lives. Anna Anderson settled in America, married a man who reveled in the belief that she was Anastasia. 
became Anastasia Manahan by marriage and died in 1984 of pneumonia, her true identity still unknown. It wasn't until a posthumous lawsuit where DNA from a section of Manahan's small intestine that had been removed and kept by a pathology laboratory was tested that it was confirmed that Anastasia Manahan was an unrelated Polish woman named Franziska. Believing that one of the Romanovs survived makes their deaths a tiny bit less tragic. We want to believe the fairy tale even if it goes against our judgment. But despite none of the Romanov family surviving that night in 1918, what they and their bodies went through is the stuff of legends. The hope is that their bodies and their stories can all soon be put to rest in the same place, now more than a hundred years since their execution. This video was made with generous donations from death enthusiasts just like you. Whew, I'm really wearing autumnal colors here and sort of an aspirational thing, but it is hot as balls. Very Netflix style, very documentary, and we're a very established organization of movie people on the YouTube. Into their undergarments as an insurance policy. <sighs> All right, it's fine. We're fine. Everybody's fine. It's no big deal. It was too shallow. Only nine feet. <sighs> I'm so hot and so tired. I'll sit like this for a while. It's the thumbnail here. And the mitochondrial DNA. Oh, what? Strike three, three, three. Stop that truck. You stop that beeping truck. The TV show Unsolved Mysteries, University of California, Berkeley, Cambridge interview. Do I look insane? Relax. And I dick her, sir. <laughs>